All right. Um, I am honored to be with all of you today, and especially with the three of you. Uh, over the last day and a half, you've heard and had a chance to talk about the plan to get to full equality, as the big sign says, on our terms, and the kinds of investments that's gonna, that are going to uh, be required to get us there. And you've heard from smart advocates and strategists about the tools in their arsenal, whether it's litigation, executive action, public education. But I think as we all know in this room, the driving force behind the progress in our community, in our movement, has always been the stories of real people. These are the stories uh, that have prompted people to action, that have changed hearts and minds. Uh, and I know it's, it's something I've seen throughout my entire career. Uh, when I was in the Obama administration, first at the Pentagon and then at the White House, uh, it was always the stories of LGBTQ people, whether it was gay or lesbian service members who were desperate to serve the country they love, or trans women of color facing uh, violence and discrimination on our streets, or young people being bullied in the classroom. Those were the stories that prompted the president and his cabinet to take action. And it's the same thing that I saw actually in my time at the Gill Foundation. And I think one of the most powerful examples of storytelling I can think of in recent years was in 2016 when I was uh, with the foundation. We brought a group of trans service members to the Pentagon to meet with the Secretary of Defense. And that meeting changed his mind. And uh, as, as Kate mentioned, in my current job as uh, Chief of Staff to a Congresswoman who recently talked about having a non-binary child, I've seen the impact of that story on her colleagues and on countless trans people and their parents across the country who reached out just to say thank you. Like, thank you for having us, uh, being a voice for us and having us be heard. So that's why at the, near the end of this outgiving, we want to bring the focus back to the stories of real people. Um, and these are stories that are, yes, uh, stories of discrimination and harm, but they're also stories of strength and resilience and courage. And so thank you all for being here, being willing to tell your stories. And Matt, I'd like to start with you. Um, and most of you who were at dinner last night got a glimpse of Matt's story in that powerful video uh, that we saw. And Matt, as you heard, is a conversion therapy survivor who serves as co-founder of Born Perfect, where he leads a team of lawyers and survivors committed to protecting LGBTQ young people from that incredibly vile practice. So Matt, please, we start with your story. Thank you. <clears throat> that, was, that was great. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's my mother. Oh, I'll talk about her in a second. I might have the chicken pox in that photo. I was just happier to not be at school. Um, so when I was 16, my father sent me to conversion therapy for five years. Uh, he and he never intended to lose me, but actually save me from what he imagined would destroy my life, which is my own identity. My dad, Effie, is an Israeli-born U.S. immigrant who came to New York driving yellow cabs, working his way to achieving the American dream, building an international real estate and engineering business. He always taught me, never be offended by the insults, bullying, or egos by the other boys at school and that my true masculinity is to rise above that. However, I already knew that I was a gay closeted teenager, which didn't align with the values of masculinity around me. So I found myself playing the role of masculinity, dating or having the perception of dating women. I was throwing parties at my parents' home behind their backs, really just to gain popularity at school. And I was being competitive with, with all the boys until the day I got attacked. I was knocked unconscious and hospitalized. 11 high school senior boys surrounded me in a circle on a busy sidewalk on a Friday afternoon, leaving me no opportunity to run away. My nose broken in six places and my skin tore open from the top of my brow. I can't express any more pain that I felt not from the physical pain, but the pain of my own self-esteem. My masculinity was crushed. I needed to come out to my dad because it was survival. And I needed to find out that my dad was going to protect me as his gay son. So I told my father. To my surprise, he said, I love you, and you have nothing to worry about hugging me as I trembled in my own tears. My father began to search for how he can support me, and that week, my father discovered conversion therapy. A licensed professional in New York City explained to my father that there is no such thing as homosexuality. 
with my <clears throat> and further that anything of the LGBTQ plus spectrum can be narrowed down to a childhood trauma. And that if I were to heal my traumas, I would overcome my same sex attractions, other, also known as SSA. For my father, this was an opportunity, a chance that I could still live my life without being gay, which he believed was a better life. And with my absolute trust and love for my father, I began conversion therapy. My therapist and I dug deep into my life to find where was I traumatized as a kid. I was really lucky. I could not point out any specific time that my parents really caused me any harm. And that is something I'm still grateful for. What my therapist saw was a young boy with two older sisters, an affectionate mother, and too many female friends. I was immediately separated from the girls and women in my life, while understanding that women are my opposites, and that when I'm ready, I will learn how to seduce them, leading to successfully having a heter heterosexual relationships. For three years, I did not speak to my mother and two sisters. My family was in distress. Jane, my mother, could not comprehend any therapy that entails estranging a child from its mother. My sisters, Melanie and Nancy, did not, want, did not know which parent to listen to. While my father's desperation for me to become straight had the final say in my home. I was trained in how to make male friends. I was also very good at that. <laughs> I became popular with all the boys at school. I began to have romantic and intimate relationships with women. And none of it gave me the validation of who I really am. My mental health was deteriorating. I could not shake off the shame I felt for every male I found myself attracted to. That wasn't going away. I would race to the emergency room convinced that I was having a heart attack. Nurses and doctors would explain to me that I was healthy and assured me that my pain were just mere panic attacks. For two years, I contemplated my possible suicide. And I'm here. I held on to the smallest possibility that I could, maybe, live life as my authentic self. I'm one of 700,000 people in the U.S. and counting that have been through conversion therapy. I co-founded Born Perfect, a team of lawyers and conversion therapy survivors who are working together to end conversion therapy nationwide. Law and media are our strongest channels. Script editing and training the talent for the film Boy Race, as you all got to see last night, is just one of the ways we reach large audiences. Drafting, introducing, and passing legislation has been our greatest success. To date, Born Perfect has passed legislation protecting LGBTQ youth from conversion therapy in 17 states and more than 45 municipalities. I left conversion therapy 10 years ago, and I look at what we accomplished. It's almost hard for me to fathom that I almost took my life away. I have a great relationship with both my mother and my father. <clears throat> and that's what really what it's all about. Every parent who places their child in conversion therapy is hoping their child will continue to be a, a part of their community by never living the gay lifestyle. And every child, every, sorry, every LGBTQ child wants to know that their family will accept them into their community unconditionally. And that is the gap. I know ending conversion therapy bridges that gap, bringing families and their LGBTQ members together. This movement is the domino effect for all LGBTQ movements. My commitment is for families to grow and prosper, having all LGBTQ people be in the fabric of our society. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt, and thank you for the work you're doing to ensure that other young people don't have to experience what you did. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in 2016, uh, the last president and Secretary of Defense were able to lift the transmilitary ban, but as we all know, the current one has reinstated that terrible policy. Um, Nick is a, uh, let me see, get this right, you're a 25-year-old um, trans man fighting that ban in court, and you're, as Kate said, an Army ROTC cadet. Yes. And you're also a substitute teacher and a driving instructor, so you're busy. I am. Um, <laughs> so, Nick, first of all, thank you for your commitment to service. Um, can you tell us your story? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just, just a quick side note, I also live on a family farm, hence the picture of me holding the adorable <laughs> calf, um, for those wondering. <laughs> So uh, in 2015, I was in my final stretch of college, the first time around, um, and I had a professor pull me aside, and this particular professor was teaching a class on global security and counterterrorism, and I can't even tell you her name or her job title because she was so high up in the intelligence field, she wasn't allowed to share that information with me, uh, let alone me share it with anybody else. And this professor pulled me aside and said to me, Nick, I've seen your work in my class. I've heard you speak. I've seen your writings. Why are you not in the United States military? You are such a huge asset. You could be doing so much. Why are you not doing this? And I said to her, you know, Professor, unfortunately, at this time, I am not allowed to enlist in the military because I'm transgender. And she said to me, that is the stupidest reason I have ever heard in my entire life for them to not allow somebody into the military. Um, and that was when it really clicked with me, like, yeah, she's absolutely right. This is a terrible reason for me to not be allowed to do this. So I spent the next year doing some research. And in 2016, it seems that the Obama administration agreed with that sentiment of hers because they announced they would allow open transgender military service. Um, at the time this announcement was made, I was out of state for work. So as soon as I got home to Ohio, I got on my computer. I started getting in touch with every recruiter I could find in the entire state. And after months of being told no by Army recruiters, by Air Force recruiters, by almost everybody I'd reached out to, I was finally able to connect with an Air Force recruiter who said to me, Nick, I have never even met a transgender person, let alone helped one enlist in the military. If you are willing to work with me, I would love to take this journey with you. So in December of 2016, I jumped in my car. I drove two and a half hours away to Mansfield, Ohio, and began to work with my Air Force recruiter. Um, he and I filled out the initial paperwork and we submitted it to the medical processing station, which is the next step. And they have to go through my brief medical history and give me the green light to come have a physical exam and take a written examination. Um, so we heard back from them in early December of 2017, and they had said, you know, we know policy allows you to enlist, but we're not quite ready to process any transgender recruits. Call us back in June. Um, so that's exactly what they did. And same kind of message. They said, uh, we're still not ready. Call us back at the end of July. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that July, I was at my summer job again, uh, which involves truck driving. So you know, I'm, I'm driving a commercial truck. And my childhood best friend happened to be my partner in the truck this day. And he's sitting on his phone. And he says to me, Nick, I think you need to pull the truck over. I need to tell you something, and you don't want to be driving when you hear what I have to tell you. Um, so that's exactly what I did. I found the nearest rest stop, and he read to me some tweets by the President of the United States that said, I'm not going to allow transgender people to serve in the military under any capacity. End of story. Um, and at first, I thought it was a bad joke. I thought it was just my friend you know, trying to pull some horrible prank on me. I had to pull out my phone and read them for myself for it to finally sink in. And uh, you know, at that moment, I had no idea what to do. It was like everything I'd been working for, everything I wanted had just been ripped out from under me for no reason whatsoever. But I knew that I had to fight back. Uh, so I started looking for anything I could possibly find, anybody else who might be in a similar situation to myself. And I saw a posting on social media by um, a transgender veteran who had said, hey, did anybody, was anybody in the process of enlisting or already enlisted? And you know, who out there has been affected by this? Please reach out to me. I want to help. And I got in touch with him immediately. And he put me in touch with my wonderful legal team. 
and I've been working with them ever since on fighting this ban. Um, as, as everything has been kind of up and down with this policy, I continued to work with my Air Force recruiter. I submitted hundreds of pages of documentation. They wanted my entire medical history from the day I was born, and this is something that would not have been asked for had I not been transgender. I mean, they, they wanted to know every single time I've ever been to the emergency room, even as a child. Um, and in March of 2018, they had finally called my recruiter back and they said, well, we have decided that we are going to disqualify Nicholas just because it's, it's too much paperwork, there's, there's too much unknown with him being transgender, we're disqualifying him. And since this station processes all branches of the military, they didn't just disqualify me from the Air Force, they disqualified me from ever serving um, by enlisting in the traditional route. So that day in March 2018, I received that phone call at about 7 o'clock in the morning. At 8 o'clock in the morning, I got in my car and I drove back to my college where I had graduated from in 2015. I immediately re-enrolled to take more classes and I went to see the Army ROTC recruiter. Um, they use a different processing station than normal enlistment uses. It's still the same physical exam but they have their own review board. It, it's like a fresh start. They don't take into consideration what this other board had already told me. Um, so I came in and I asked him, how do I get involved with this program? And he said, sign here and sign up for this class. And that's exactly what I did. I began participating in Army ROTC this past fall, 2018. I have been actively involved in the program ever since. Um, I'm making wonderful friends, showing up, doing everything. And unfortunately, with this policy that was just released a few weeks ago on April 12th, I am now being told that I can still attend basic camp this summer and go through the same training as everybody else. I can continue with the program for the next two years and meet all of the same requirements as everybody else, all of the same tests, all of the same standards, everything that everybody else does. And the difference is every other person in that program will walk away with a job as an army lieutenant and student loan forgiveness and access to all of the benefits that the military offers and I will walk away being able to say that I participated in the program. Um, so you know at this point I'm in a gray area but this entire journey has been a roller coaster ride and I'm at one of the low points now but I know that eventually we're going to get back onto that high point and eventually we are going to get this ban done away with once and for all and we just have to see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that even though right now we're taking the scenic route we will reach that final destination thank you you're right, it's a stupid policy. <laughs> and I don't know anyone who, who, could, who could meet you and not think this is exactly the kind of person we'd want in our military. So thank you for fighting it. Thank you. Um, our last speaker, yeah, please. Um, our last speaker really needs no introduction. We all know you, Dennis, and we have admired you from near and from afar. Um, I remember being at the signing ceremony for the lob that bears your son's name, and it's a moment that will stay in my mind forever. So I think I speak on behalf of everyone here. Thank you for everything you've done to make our world more safe and just and equal. And please, over to you. Well. <laughs> it's very kind of you to say that, but I had nothing to do with it. Um, It was Judy. We lost Matt in October of 98, and I was in Saudi Arabia working. And Judy and, and Logan were there when we, when we lost him. So we had a choice at that time to uh, say we had one son, and we're proud of him. or we could have a dysfunctional marriage for 12 years. And say we had two sons and we're proud of both of them. So I went back to Saudi Arabia for 12 years by myself to pay the bills, to help finance Judy's initial work. 
and she stayed here. Now, as part of that, um, as, as background, Matt was a typical pain in the butt son. Um, he was much too intelligent for his father. When he, when he died, he spoke English, German, Japanese, Italian, and Arabic. He wanted to work for the State Department overseas. He wanted to bring the same rights, privileges, responsibilities, and dreams that he had being an American citizen to other countries. And at that time, we thought, great. He'd come out to us individually. We had no problem. He's still, still my son. I could care as long as he's safe, as long as he is a good person and uh, treats others with respect. It wasn't until he died that we found out all the violence, all the hate, all the discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Because we're just country bumpkins from Wyoming. We knew nothing about it. So we had a choice, as I said, so we had a this dysfunctional marriage where Judy, who is a 15 on a 10 scale introvert, stayed here as a really pissed off mother that somebody would be judge, jury, and executioner and take away her son just because he was different. Well, look around, folks. Not two of you here that look alike. And that's the blessing of this country. None of us look alike, think alike, act alike, are alike. And that's what makes us such a great country. So, in the hospital, while Matt was still there, we were trying to figure out what to do. And we're starting to get, even then, we're starting to get checks and cash coming in. Not big amounts, you know, $20 here from some young person, $10, $100 to help pay the medical bills. And we said, no, we can't use that money for that. That's our responsibility. He's our son. What can we do with it? So we thought, well, we'll help Matt's community. And Matt died on October 12, 1998. Two weeks later, I went back to Saudi Arabia to go to work. Judy stayed here, and on his birthday, his 22nd birthday, she started the foundation using the money that was sent to us to help pay the bills. And as an introvert, it was very hard for her to talk to people. Her first speaking engagement was in March of 99, the US Senate. Welcome to the real world. She started lobbying and, and she found out that she couldn't do that because she could see this is what you need to do. You need to protect the kids. And these people had other ideas. They had the lobbyists who were funding them. They weren't worried about what was what should be done, what was right to do, it was what was best for them. And I use the example, you have a rectangle, three layers, red, white, and blue. When this country was founded, the top one was, 
what's best for my country? The middle layer was, what's best for my state? The bottom layer is, what's best for me? This is the way it is today. What's best for my country is last. She found out that they would say the things they needed to say, but they wouldn't do anything about it afterwards. So she, she starts traveling to universities, uh, high schools, church groups, anybody who wanted to hear her message. And the question comes up, do you ever go where you're not welcome? And she says, no, because we're not invited there. And one day she said, you know, I'm so exhausted. I'm speaking to the choir. And I told her, yes, but the choir needs practice. You have to talk to them because that gives them the encouragement to go out and make change. So we get credit because Matt's name with Mr. Bird is on this law. The first legislation, national legislation, that only, not only protected LGBTQ community, but also protected those, it, it's sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, perception for this hate crime law. This person is perceived to be gay. This person who is Sikh is perceived to be Muslim. But also, the law also made, recognized Jews as a race. One of the Civil Rights Act of 64 is just a religion. And Judy gets credit for that, and she won't take it. Because if you think about it, the ones who put that law into effect are all of you. You are the grassroots and the groundswell under Bush that we knew no laws and social issues were going to be passed. He wouldn't pass them when he was governor of Texas. There's no way he was going to do it as president of the United States. So all that time, there's just groundswell. And Judy's speaking and talking about the issues. But in 99, she was one of the first to start also talking about bullying before it became a buzzword. She's talking about taking care of our kids and not just LGBTQ, all of our kids, because all of our kids are important. Our kids are our national treasure. If we lose them, we're a third-rate country like that. That's why the panel today talking about education is so critical. We have to protect and save our kids. We have to give them all hope, courage, encouragement, and support. We have to help them regardless of where they come from, who they believe in, what kind of food they eat, anything, an equal chance to succeed based on their own abilities, their desire to work hard, and the choices they make in life, not because they're different. So that's what we've been doing with foundation since then. It's evolved. It started off just <clears throat> working and, and trying to protect LGBTQ. And then it evolved to all the kids. And now, under this administration, we are taking on uh, another big issue. Do you know that there has been no hate crime reported in Houston in the last six years. They have no hate crimes. Safest place to live. Miami has reported one since 2002. So the Department of Justice under President Obama started doing these hate crime conferences about getting the, the law, the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act out to the public so that law enforcement would know about it, 
uh, prosecutors and defense lawyers would know about it, NGOs would know about it, and the general public would know what the law said and how it protected you and what you needed to do. But it was to try and get law enforcement to report hate crimes. We can't fix problems with hate crimes if we don't know there is a hate crime. So DOJ and the FBI would bring us in and we would speak at these hate crime conferences and encourage them to start reporting hate crimes. Under this administration, that stopped. They've gotten rid of, of their civil rights groups, a lot of their community liaisons who are critical working with all the marginalized communities. So what we've, we're taking on now, we are creating the hate crime conferences. We try and find corporate partners or anybody else who can help us, help us fund these so we can bring in the speakers, bring in law enforcement, provide them lunch and talk about what you need to do. And, and to get them to start reporting at their local community and at the state level and then at the national level. Because with that, we know where to take and, and focus. Is it on, are the hate crimes on, on the Somali population in Minnesota? Are the LGBT in Atlanta, Georgia? We don't know because nobody's reporting. And it's even harder under this administration. Who's going to report a hate crime when in 30 states you can still be fired for being gay if you're gay? You're not going to report being vandalized, being beaten. And it's the same with immigrants. Now if you report that as an immigrant you have been beaten and robbed, well, you'd go to the, to the law enforcement. They're afraid to do it because they're in a holding tank somewhere, holding cell, never to come out again. So we're emphasizing hate crime reporting, but at the same time, we're trying to get our audiences to talk about changing the laws at the local level for discrimination and protections at the state level and at the national level. We need the Equality Act passed for this country. And as, as everybody says, the way this gets done is to get support of all of you to do something. You need to tell your story. That's good. But you need to... The LGBTQ community is outnumbered. Eight and a half to one. Without the straight community as allies... You're going nowhere. It's, be realistic. The straight community wants to help, but they don't know what questions to ask. And then a lot of times if they're afraid of asking a stupid question because then you're going to be mad and not talk to them. I have the same problem when I when it comes to the transgender issues. I'm not transgender. I have no idea what they're going through. And I will ask really stupid questions until I can understand. But they have to have the patience to put up with a stupid old man till I can understand. So have patience and let them help you. It's critical. And, and you're doing a great job from the LGBTQ if you're just out there living your life. You are my heroes because you're out there living a normal life. You get up in the morning, you take a shower, you have breakfast, you go to work, you come home, you read the paper, you go to the grocery store, you mow the grass, you pay the bills. You're just as boring as the straight community. <laughs> and that's important. They need to know that. And you're seeing these changes coming. The young people, most of them do not care who's holding whose hand. 
big deal. They're more concerned with climate change, gun violence, getting a job, the wars that we're involved in. But we need to encourage them to continue to do that. What you saw, the tragedy at Parkland, is what encourages us at the foundation to continue. The survivors are so angry, and they made such change in this country. They've encouraged other young people. They are my generation's Vietnam War protesters, and they will carry this activism for the rest of their life. Even where I live in Casper, Wyoming, the high schools there have, are taking a sick day, the students and they're all going outside on the same day to protest climate change because they know they have the power even influencing their parents and their siblings if they can't vote themselves but they know when I turn 18 you're gone and that's what you have to do thank you ladies for running for office we have too much testosterone in this country and we need to Push it back. <laughs> and as a, as a real old geezer, I'm upset with we ha the do-nothing Congress that we've had for years because there are so many issues that need to be taken care of to protect our kids and get them out there doing things. And my goal is everybody over 55 should be snuffed because they're putting laws into effect that the young people don't need, don't care about, and harm this country. So as, as one of the few fathers speaking around the country, I wish there were more men speaking about these issues and helping these kids. I say, push, push, push hard. Help us, all these different groups, Support them. They are doing it. But if you don't want to run for office, that's fine. But know the issues and hold the feet to the fire of your local politicians, your state politicians, and your national politicians. If you don't want to run for office, at least attend the city council meetings, the school board meetings. With your face there, you're aware of what's going on. You can spread the word and you can stop them from doing the stupid stuff that they seem to be doing. And with the foundation, we're trying to do the same thing. Get the word out, push the word, push hard. Push, push, push. We're doing it by speaking. We're involved with the Laramie Project. There's a doc the documentary, Matt Shepard is a friend of mine. They all tell the same story. Respect for each other, an equal chance. We have a, a web page called matthewsplace.com, which is for young people. So they can tell their own stories, they can have others tell their story, or they can help their friends. And we have, a, most of our bloggers are young people in their teens, telling their stories of, of their journeys of asexuality, transition, and stuff like that. If you, have, if you want to blog or know some young people, tell them to come to us. We want young people because it, others come into that and say, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And that's the important thing. None of you are alone. We are here from the straight community. Just give us a chance and open your arms to us and we'll open our arms back to you. Thank you.